Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 7th of September of 2020, and we're going to be discussing correcting magnesium deficiencies before correcting potassium deficiencies. In other words, patients who are hypomagnesemic, the reasons why we need to correct this before we fix a patient who's hypokalemic. In the ICU or in the hospital, we're obsessed with making our numbers what we call euboxic or more clearly stated, that all their lab values are within normal reference ranges. We don't like to see the values be red, green, whatever, Epic, Cerner, Metatech, McKesson, whatever EMR we use, we like to see the numbers all be the same color. That being said, electrolytes are something that we replace every single day, and our nurse friends often have protocols which instruct them on how to manage and correct these derangements. Hopefully, the goal is to A, get less phone calls for us, B, provide the nurses with more autonomy, and C, and most importantly, optimize the outcomes of our patients. When I was just a baby resident, back in, eh, I'm not going to say how old I was, but one of my mentors and good friends to this day, Dr. Mike Ruiz, taught me how to correct the magnesium, obviously when hypomagnesemia was present, before correcting the hypokalemia in patients who needed their electrolytes fixed. This left me scratching my head. Honestly, it made no sense. I'm, I'm admittedly obviously not a biochemist by any means. And when I was just a first year baby resident, I was just trying to keep my head above water and trying to write notes. He then went on to explain the mechanisms. My mind was honestly blown. I mean, how much did this guy know? And why am I so dumb? How much other stuff did I not know? How come I wasn't taught this in medical school? Well, friends, there's a lot that we weren't taught in medical school or even residency, residency or fellowship training for that matter. This is pretty much why I'm on this lifelong journey and hopefully bringing you along with me for the ride. I can't say I remember the exact mechanisms when he taught them to me. More importantly, I just put it in my head as a that's just the way it works type of thing, as many of us do for many complex processes. This is a time in the podcast where I usually go over some disclaimers. I mean, I do have to protect myself from the people who want to, you know, bother me or whatnot. Please read the article that's attached to this. It's in the show notes. It's free. It's open source. You can get it. You don't have to pay for a paywall or anything like that. Just go ahead and download it and read it for yourself. The other thing that I have to give a disclaimer about is that many of the concepts of this article are pretty damn complicated. That being said, not all the concepts are 100% proven. So that leaves things to be a little bit murky. But what does matter is that it works in clinical practice. So here's the deal. You have a patient, that patient has hypokalemia. You want to fix it. So you want to give the patient numbers to make, you want to give the patient potassium, excuse me, to make the numbers pretty. You go ahead, give some, give some potassium, do what the protocol says you should do. Then you go ahead, recheck the labs. Obviously in this whole time, the poor patient got stuck for the labs. The potassium burned a little bit on its way in because the IV was acting funny. You get the lab result. Lo and behold, the potassium did not go up. What in the world just happened? Where did it go? And so the first question you need to ask yourself is, did you check the magnesium level? Truth is, you probably didn't. Per the cited article, more than 50% of patients with hypokalemia also have concomitant hypomagnesemia. My practice in the intensive care unit is that I check the basic metabolic panel, the BMP, along with magnesium and phosphorus almost daily. This is, of course, only in patients who need it. No, no point whatsoever in being wasteful. But the point here is that there's an association between hypomagnesemia and hypokalemia. Until you fix the hypomagnesemia, you can't possibly fix the potassium. That's the key concept of this whole entire podcast. And so why does this all happen? It's time to get a little bit sciency. And please bear with me along this because it could be a little bit confusing. I know that I had to read the article that was cited myself about eh, six to ten times. And then I have a nurse practitioner student who's hanging out with me named Brian. And he had to read it about four to six times as well. And then there were still some things that we couldn't figure out. I guess we're just not that smart. It was initially suggested that on the cell itself, especially in the kidneys, that the sodium potassium ATPase pump was impaired. And therefore, this was caused by hypomagnesemia. In other words, without the appropriate magnesium level, the sodium potassium ATPase pump is not going to work. If this sodium potassium ATPase pump doesn't work, then the potassium is not going to be taken in directly from the renal cells. 
I'll explain exactly why. Again, you have potassium that's circulating in your plasma, serum, blood, whatever you want to call it. It should go into the, into the cell through this sodium potassium ATPase pump. If it doesn't work, it's not going to go into the cell. Now, this, this honestly didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to me. Because in addition, the information that's listed on this article states that this particular dysfunction would also cause the patient to urina urinate away the potassium because of a decreased uptake of potassium. And again, this didn't make sense to me. Why in the world would the cell go ahead and waste and excrete some potassium into the urine if the sodium potassium ATPase pump wasn't, wasn't working properly? Shouldn't this make the intracellular potassium stay the same and the serum potassium go up? I mean, after all, isn't the body smarter than this? But I'll explain later. To add to this, potassium is mostly reabsorbed from the urine in the proximal tubule and in the loop of Henle. Potassium secretion, however, happens a little bit later in the distal convoluted tubule, convoluted tubule, I can never say that word properly, as well as the cortical collecting duct. It turns out that the magnesium replacement decreases the secretion in the urine. I know what your next question is going to be. How in the world does magnesium decrease the secretion of potassium? All right, guys, this is, this is where we're really going to get nerdy here. <laughs> Hang on tight. If, if you thought that we weren't nerdy before, well, you're not even ready for what's about to happen. Ultimately, the article might be doing a better job than me at explaining this, but this is the best I could do. I also recommend you read them because they have some pretty pictures. I don't have any pretty pictures. You just hear my voice. But let me take a stab at it. I was always baffled and amazed at how these folks figured out all these uh, membrane potentials and all those things that's way out of my knowledge range. But all this fun stuff that I'm describing is taking place in the distal convoluted tubule as well as the cortical collecting ducts in the kidneys. First, how does potassium get into the cells from the blood? As I mentioned before, this has to come through the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. Cool. Blood to the cell via sodium potassium ATPase channels. Got it. That's easy. How do we end up secreting potassium via our urine? Well, this happens, as I mentioned before, in the distal convoluted tubules, as well as the cortical collecting duct cells, via two channels, the ROMK and MAXI-K. R-O-M-K and MAXI is M-A-X-I apostrophe K, or dash K. Yes, yeah, dash K. Well, these are responsible for the potassium excretion into the urine. These are the ways out of the cell and into the urine. Again, the ROMK and the MAXI-K. But the more important one is the ROMK. So what, is, what does the magnesium have to do with the ROMK channels? Well, magnesium, turns out, inhibits the ROMK channels at certain intracellular concentrations. So if your patient has a low magnesium, then the ROMK is going to want to waste away potassium, making the patient hypokalemic. Isn't that interesting how, I guess, the floodgates will go ahead and just open? This means that until the magnesium is fixed, you can't fix the hypokalemia because the ROMK is just going to go ahead and get rid of potassium. There are the components that play a role in this, such as sodium as well as aldosterone, but that's a little too esoteric for my taste, and it would really make you turn off this podcast. Ultimately, there's so much for us to learn. So let's just start wrapping this up now. Why does low magnesium cause hypokalemia? And I've already mentioned the two main factors, being the sodium potassium ATPase pumps as well as the ROMK. And potassium cannot go from plasma into the cells of the kidneys unless the sodium potassium ATPase channel is working. As I mentioned before, magnesium helps this channel work. So if you don't have enough magnesium, you can do whatever you want, but the sodium potassium ATPase pump is not going to work properly. At the same time, the intracellular concentration of potassium is going, to be remain, is going to remain low. Why exactly, you ask? Honestly, it's not, it's not described, and it's, it's quite frustrating. My postulation is that the cells are so hungry for potassium that they do get some potassium into the cell via sodium-potassium ATPase pump, but at the same time, the same amount is being excreted. Now, the literature does not suggest that the hypomagnesemia is like an on-off switch so for the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. So that's the reason why I postulate that it must work to a certain degree. Therefore, continuing to deplete the plasma concentrations that you and I measure, we, we never are able to see the potassium go up. 
I mean, just if, if for example, you have a sodium potassium of 3.2, you go ahead and you give a patient 40 mil equivalents thinking that it's going to bring it up to, say, 3.6, for example, and you go ahead and you measure it again and it's still 3.2, what I figure is that some of it went intracellularly, but at the same time, it's being excreted through the ROMK. I hope that makes sense to some, to some extent. Because ultimately, magnesium, what it does is help limit potassium excretion into the urine by controlling the ROMK pump. I hope that this helps you understand why, and again, I'm, I don't expect you to memorize the ROMK and the sodium potassium ATPase pump, but you should understand that you need to absolutely fix the magnesium before you go ahead and fix the potassium. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting money and, uh, you know, making the patient uncomfortable in the whole process. People have asked me in the, in the past if there's a time factor between giving magnesium and potassium, but I haven't seen any data whatsoever saying that, you know, you have to wait like half an hour between between uh, administrations. I, we, we just don't know. All right, that's, that's enough uh, podcast for today. Hope you guys learned something. If you've enjoyed anything in this podcast, if you're listening to it on iTunes or on Spotify, please give me a good review. I mean, it's a way of saying thank you since you're not sending me a check. If you're listening to this on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. And that's, that's about it. Have a great day. Bye.